I'll bring you some breaking news now coming to us from Lancashire Police in connection with the search for missing uh, Katie Kenyon, 33-year-old uh, mother of two. The police say they have sat sadly found the body of a woman. The discovery was made last night in an area uh, as part of the forest of Boland after receiving new information. Katie's family became concerned when they realised that not only had no one seen her all day, but the bits of contact they had had with her over text didn't sound like they were from her at all. She texted her 12-year-old daughter saying that there was a salad in the fridge and her daughter replied saying that she'd eaten it. Just seconds later, the youngster's phone pinged again. This time, two laughing emojis came from her mum's phone. But the police would later discover that by the time those texts were sent, Katie had been missing for almost an hour. And CCTV footage from the house nearby would show Katie's final moments, and they showed her being driven off, never to be seen alive again. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. This video is made from various source documents listed in the show notes. I use news archives, documentary footage and court documents, and so the videos are accurate to the source materials I can find. Katie's family and friends were concerned when, on the 22nd of April 2022, they started receiving puzzling text messages from her. Katie's daughter got a message at around 2pm saying, Hey, I love you and I'm sorry. Ring your dad, he will be looking after you for a while from today. Need to get help so I can be a better person for you and your brother. Please know I love you and I'm not upset with you. Officers turned up at Andrew Burfield's front door after his ex-partner Katie Kenyon went missing. The pair had started dating in July of 2019 and Katie's family and friends told officers that they needed to check out Andrew's house and ask him if he knew where she was. And when the officers arrived, they saw straight away that Katie's car was parked outside. Andrew answered the door and let the police come inside. And once they were in his living room, one of the officers asked if he knew where Katie was. But Andrew replied that he didn't, but he'd gotten fairly normal texts from her all afternoon. He held the phone for them to see, and one showed that he'd asked what she was up to, and at around 1.30pm she'd message back, saying she was just out for a walk. This was obviously good news, if Katie was texting then surely she was okay. But police would later question family and friends about other text received from Katie's phone. And it quickly became clear because of grammatical errors or just words in the messages that it was obvious Katie wouldn't use. It was clear that the person texting from Katie's phone most likely wasn't her. Katie's phone had sent text messages to her 14-year-old son and 12-year-old daughter, but again, didn't sound like how their mum would usually text. The 14-year-old boy had also gotten an Instagram message from his mum's account trying to arrange care for the family dog, Indy. What the son found odd was that the messages kept spelling the dog's name incorrectly, and this is something he knew his mum had never done before. After that, Andrew pointed police to the fact that he'd arrived home from the school run at 9.15am. He'd seen that Katie had dropped off a number of items in the house, including her keys. And this was worrying in itself. There was no reason that Katie would have gone off without her keys. She would have needed them to go about her day-to-day -day activities. He even played a voice message for police that he'd left for Katie. Hi, I'm at work. Listen, I've just got your message. Will you, will you please ring me? I'm a bit worried. Just ring me. You don't have to do this. I'm not, you know, I'm not worried about the money. I'm not worried about the money. Just ring me, please. Thank you. After that, one of the officers asked if Andrew was concerned, to which he replied that he was. And that same officer goes in on him, asking that if he's concerned, why hadn't he reported any of this? Andrew fumbles for a bit, before saying that he just thought she was being silly. He then went on to say that he believed Katie had simply taken herself to rehab. She had told him she was going to go and get herself sorted, and so he assumed that she was in some kind of rehab clinic. But the police weren't convinced. Earlier that day, when Katie's friends and family had contacted them, they all said that there was only one person in mind who could be responsible for her disappearance. Just a few weeks earlier, Katie had told her sister Jenny that if anything ever happened to her, 
they needed to look at her ex-partner, Andrew. The police launched a major public appeal for any information that might help them to identify where Katie was at, or simply to get anyone that had seen her that morning to get in touch. And they did get a call from an eyewitness, who said that it was around 9.30am that Friday morning that they'd seen a woman matching Katie's description, getting into a van with a man, and that man matched Andrew's description. Alongside this, the investigating team gathered mobile phone data from Katie's phone, and they found that it had travelled away from the house and moved at some speed towards an area of woodland called Gisborne Forest. It stays here for around 51 minutes before travelling back to Andrew's house. The investigating team then managed to collect a number of CCTV and AMPR images from around that area, and the footage clearly showed Andrew's van with Katie sitting in the passenger seat, travelling in the direction of Gisborne Forest. And then after the phone data puts Katie's phone moving back towards the house, the images of the van show that hauntingly, Katie is no longer in the passenger side seat. And in fact, the entire front portion of the vehicle is on show and it's clear that Katie isn't in it. And this is when the investigating team really start to believe they've got the evidence in place to, at the very least, bring Andrew down to the police station for questioning. The fact that Katie has been seen by witnesses and there's video footage of the two of them in his van at 9.30 a.m., means that he lied to them about the last time he saw her being earlier that morning. And he said he'd gotten home from doing the school run and she just wasn't there. And so they head back to the house and when they go inside, they immediately notice that it is extremely hot. This is odd because it was an abnormally hot day in April. And inside of the house, it wasn't just a little bit warm, but it was boiling hot. Andrew had the log burner on and it was pumping out heat into the house. And so it's then that they arrest Andrew on suspicion of kidnap and bring him into the station to question him, thinking that in the log burner, there may be some kind of evidence. Andrew continued to say that he had no idea where Katie was at. And he repeated his claim that the only place he could think of that she might be would be a rehab center or clinic, but he couldn't give any specifics about where that might be. Obviously, the police have the area near Burnley that they need to search, that's Gisborne Forest, but the forest itself is absolutely massive. The Burnley Police Department call in the help of Lancashire Police, but they just don't have enough people to search all 25 square miles of it, and they desperately need to narrow down their priority search area. They don't know what kind of a state Katie is in. They're obviously hoping that she's going to be found alive and well, but Time really is of the essence. Thankfully, they do get a call from someone that Andrew knows, where he'd previously been carrying out some building work and he'd asked when the bins were due to be taken out. This in itself was odd because Andrew wasn't due to be working that day. It was a Saturday and it was 8.15 a.m. This was also the day after Katie had gone missing. And so police went to that site and they searched the areas that Andrew had been, including the bin storage. When looking through those bins, the owner of that site said that they had checked it earlier and underneath the rubbish they'd already put in there was another bag of rubbish that someone, presumably Andrew, had put in there underneath. Forensics took the bin bag away and inside they found a pair of flip-flops that were soon identified as belonging to Katie. And on top of this, they found a number of blood-stained bags and there was a lot of blood. This is beyond worrying and the case is stepped up immediately. They're still hopeful, but know how unlikely it is, given the amount of blood that was found, that they'd ever find Katie alive. It's not totally clear if Andrew was made aware of this discovery, but it's likely that he was, because the next advancement of the case is that Andrew wanted to talk to the police again. So, he's taken into an interview room and the police officer just says, you want to talk to us, so I'll hand over to you. And the accident he said happened is honestly one of the most unbelievable ones that I've ever heard. I have covered almost 100 episodes of Red Rum and I have never heard anything like this. Andrew said that he'd accidentally thrown an axe at Katie and that's how she died. In the middle of a forest, 
He said that he'd been aiming his axe at a tree and his reason for this change is at one point he says that he was just chopping some firewood and at another point he says that he and Katie were having a picnic and Katie had opened a can of coke and said to him, I bet you can't hit the can of coke with the axe, bet I can. I won't because I'll probably take your arm off. And I went for the tree at the side of her and it, it hit her in the head. In one police interview, he says he didn't fall or slip or anything. In his words, it was the stupidest thing he's done, but yes, he accidentally threw the ax at her. He says he was eight foot away from her when he did this, but he goes on to say that he was covered in her blood. How he's gone from being that far away from her to suddenly being absolutely covered in her blood, he doesn't explain. And then after that, Andrew said his mind went to what he needed to do next. And that was that he would take his own life. But he quickly decides against this based on two reasons. The first, he says, is that he didn't have a means of doing it. So he needed to go home and get his nail gun. And the other reason is that he hadn't got his finances in order. He went to the van and then he said that he headed back into the forest to the place where Katie was lying on the ground. He said he then dug a shallow grave, placed her inside and then went back home. But the questioning officer does not believe this for a second and she really lets him know this. The thing is, Andrew, you've told us a lot over the last few days, haven't you? And you've told us a lot, certainly today, a lot of information. And a lot of it just does not add up, okay? And ultimately, we don't believe you of what you've said, okay? But do not believe that this has been an accident. This is about your control and your over, over Katie and you're losing the control. After that, the same officer questions him about his involvement with other women and generally his relationship and disrespect of women, which Andrew does not want to talk about. There's no playing good cop here. She just tells him exactly what she knows about his previous behaviour. The investigating team are still having a really hard time trying to identify where Katie's at though. If she's dead as Andrew has told them, and as the blood evidence points to, then they need to bring her body home. Not only for the family, but also so that they can build up an accurate picture of what actually happened out there on that April morning. They obviously can't just take Andrew's word for it, and that's when they get a phone call from a member of the public who says that they're pretty sure that they had seen Andrew's van parked up near a section of the woods on the morning of the disappearance. They thought it was his because there was a very specific black panel on the side of it and that was unique to Andrew's van. And so the police headed out there, but this time they have Andrew with them. He has agreed to take them to where Katie's body is. In the Lancashire police video, which I'll link in the show notes, one of the detectives outlines that bringing Andrew out to the crime scene was risky, but they felt that they needed to do it. And she goes on to speak about the risks specifically being of Andrew potentially escaping, or at the very least injuring the team in an escape attempt or for any other reason. Back in the interview room, the same officer who was questioning Andrew about the inconsistencies in his story says that she knows he went to an extraordinary level of planning to make sure that this happened exactly how he wanted it to. When they found Katie's body, the team realised that the gravesite had been extremely carefully planned. The soil had a perfectly flat surface. There was no way that you'd be able to tell this area had been dug up recently. In fact, Andrew had removed the grave in a very ordered way and he'd replaced it back in the exact same way. The topsoil, the other soil, the clay, all in the right places, and then covered that with moss and sticks. It's something that would have taken a huge amount of time and there's no way Andrew would have been able to do it all in the time that he was there on that morning. Basically, he would have had to prepare the scene well ahead of time. In terms of motive, it soon became evident that Andrew's behaviour towards Katie had been worrying and aggressive in a number of ways over the last little while. Police found evidence of an email from Katie to a debt collection company in March saying that Andrew had agreed to pay the remaining balance. And text messages back this up, showing that Andrew told Katie he'd already paid it. But 
in an email sent the next day from Andrew to the debt collection company, he says that they need to put pressure on Katie to pay the remaining balance. And because he keeps leaving it and telling Katie it's been paid, the amount is getting significantly higher and higher. His manipulation and lies are off the chart. They also found evidence in Andrew's iCloud that he drafted messages on his own phone and then saved them in his notes app. And these messages were pretending to be from Katie. And they were some of the messages that her family and friends received on the day of her disappearance. This included ones to her children saying that their dad would be looking after them for a while. These messages they found in his notes had been drafted as early as the 17th of March, over a month before he killed Katie. So the premeditation here is undeniably clear. The day before Katie was killed, Andrew edited 28 notes in his notes app and police suspected that he was editing minute details like times or emojis so that he could make them as accurate and realistic as possible. Knowing what he's done to her, knowing that she's dead, he then uses the next few hours to build up his alibi. There's one text that he sent saying, you've turned off your phone again, just know when you're ready to talk, I'm here, I'll support you in any way I can, I love you, remember that. All the while, of course, he knows that she's dead. The trial went ahead and it was revealed that Katie had died from multiple head injuries and she'd suffered from severe scalp defects and shattering of the bones of the skull. And it was also presented at trial that Katie had sent a message to her mum just one month before her murder saying, I'm paranoid to death, he's going to do something, couldn't sleep all night. And just 10 days before her murder, Andrew had put chocolates and flowers on Katie's car windscreen when it was parked outside of her workplace. And then the day before the murder, CCTV shows Andrew actually with Katie and the pair are hugging and kissing. And it seems by all accounts that they might be back on track to get back together. But later that same day, Andrew's texts show that he was messaging someone else that he'd been seeing, he'd been dating someone on the side. And on that same day, after he'd been with Katie, Andrew had gone to his dad's house and he'd picked up a spade. And the prosecution alleged that this spade he had later used to dig Katie's grave. Andrew accepted the evidence that he had traveled to the area of the forest in the day before he killed Katie. And he didn't really have much of a choice at this point other than to admit it because at the crime scene they found two different sets of shoe prints and they both belonged to Andrew and that meant that he had been there twice and it's unlikely that he would have been there in two different shoes at the same time on the same day. There's also CCTV and AMPR evidence that shows Andrew in his van in the days prior to the murder and they place him at the scene of the crime for around an hour, which police suspect that was the time that he would have used to uh, dig the grave before he'd actually taken her there. But the trial only got to day three before Andrew changed his plea to guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 32 years. And the judge said that he should be prepared to spend the rest of his life behind bars. Thank you for watching this episode of Red Rum. If you like this sort of content, please uh, click the thumbs up button. I would really appreciate it. And if you've got case suggestions, whack them down below. I'll add them to my list. And I'll see you next week for another episode of Red Rum.